Good evening, everyone. My name is John Tapes, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Rooster Town. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this unpredictable night of weather and uh, just say how happy it is to see all of you here to celebrate the launch of Bombing the Moon by Nancy Chislett, published by Now or Never Publishing. I have a few housekeeping notes and a few brief introductions before I remove myself from the stage as I'm keenly aware I'm the least interesting person behind a microphone tonight. Uh, so just a few very quick notes. Uh, first of all, when you're in the space, we just ask that you remain masked, at least for the duration of the event. Uh, once we move outside for the book signing portion, at that point, masks will be recommended, uh, but will no longer be obligatory. In addition to that, uh, following some readings and a conversation between your illustrious host, Lara Ray, and Nancy Chislett, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Now, that is not just limited, limited to you people here in the atrium. If you're watching here on YouTube, you're also able to just write those questions in the Q&A box or the live chat, and we'll be able to get to them as time permits. As it seems like a vaguely unwise idea to share a microphone with a wide variety of people in one space, uh, we will just ask that you limit your questions to brief questions about the book and just tell them to me, at which point I will attempt to convey the intent of your question into the microphone for the benefit of all those watching at home, so they may hear clearly. There will be ample opportunity to offer any more extended comment or comments or praise that you might have for Nancy when you have the opportunity to chat with her by the cash desk. Uh, when the close of the event comes as well, we will also ask that you just remain seated for one moment, just so we can safely transport Nancy over, at which point you may all descend. <laughs> but that is absolutely more than enough for me. I now have the immense pleasure of introducing uh, your guests of honor for this evening. Uh, your host is one of our absolute favorite people here at the store. That would be Lara Ray, a lifelong bibliophile currently writing a memoir of her life, focusing on how the books she has read has made her who she is. Lara has taught numerous courses at McNally Robinson's community classroom and a trans literature course at the University of Winnipeg. Some of you may know tonight's featured guest, Nancy Chislett, who is an avid traveler, having visited almost 50 countries on six continents. She also plays classical music on piano and composes a little jazz. Career-wise, she has worked as a high school teacher and as a university administrator of an international student program. She recently received a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts to support her as she writes her second novel. She lives in Winnipeg with her partner, Grant, and dog, Simon. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the author of this debut novel, Nancy Chislett. All right, um, before we talk to Matt, yeah. I just seem to talk to you for a long time. Okay. Because you know me for a long time, right? Yeah. I can be sensitive. Yeah. I think so John introduced me. Right. Illustrious. That's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lara Ray, and this is so terribly exciting. I mean, there's so many exciting things about this, and so I'll just run through them in order. Uh, the first is that, you know, to be here and to see all of you, you know, on this uh, Friday night at McNally, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is exactly what I would be doing if you weren't here, which is sitting in the corner of McNally talking to myself. <laughs> and so to do it all in front of you tonight, that's, that's a bonus for me. The other, of course, is, you know, uh, us all getting back together again, you know, and this is so nice and coming out of a holiday. And so may I wish you all, you know, my fellow community members, you know, happy Easter or Passover or uh, Ramadan Mubarak. And, uh, and I'm just delighted uh, to see you all here. You know, it's been 
and just you know as a as a comic you know uh, to perform in front of people and, and talk to people again that's just it's been a it's been a hell of a couple of yeah. years you know but we made it through and you know and like all of us here you know we're we're never fully vaccinated you know i mean i i have a while you know all three right yeah. you know like some of us you know um COVID, no COVID, syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well protected in, in this wonderful urban center that we call with the pack. And uh, this is this is good. And we're going to talk uh, tonight about your your novel. Yeah. And so that's amazing. And, you know, and uh, bombing the moon. You know, and uh, I mean the title resonates with me. You know, as a as a comic. You know. <laughs> Bombing is something I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm good at. But I just want to be, uh, I want to be uh, ecumenical, egalitarian, you know. And so this is one book in the shop of all books. And so I don't want the rest of these books to feel bad, you know, because <laughs> we're favoring one, not in, not in the world like today. You know, we must acknowledge there are other books of many genders out there that we're not talking about tonight, but that doesn't mean you're bad. Okay? And so I'm going to bring one of those other books just arbitrarily to your attention. I didn't even look when I picked it up. So hopefully it's one you all might enjoy picking up. It's called Yes, We Did, Leading in Turbulent Times by Gary Fellman. <laughs> Self-published on that printing press over there. And, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about your title, but this is quite a the leading in turbulent times. It's kind of like an arsonist writing a book called Leading in Times of Unexpected House Fires. <laughs> So this is, you know, I've done this, I've done this, you know, I've done a lot of things, but I've done this where I talk to an author, you know, and often I don't know the author. Uh, sometimes I do know the author, but I think this is the first time I'm in front of a crowd of people talking to somebody who's been a friend of mine, who during our friendship became a novelist, you know, and I mean, you, you know, you probably had that in you for your whole life. And so this is, this is very exciting because I know many sides of you you know and but now we're we're here and this is a public side of you so who you know give us give us a reckoning who who are you, you know, nancy yeah yeah well i'm who nancy <laughs> uh, i'm nancy chislett uh i'm a person who's been just quietly writing uh at home for about four years now and uh always dreamt about being an author since early days in elementary school. And uh, yeah, I think it, I always did have it in me, you know, and uh, I feel very lucky to finally have the chance to, to do what I really want to do. You know, I've been doing a little reflecting as one does when something like this is coming up and, and I know how lucky I am. And for one of the, one of the reasons is, is that I really feel lately as if I am finally becoming who I am. Who I always was. Oh, and um, so. Can't really relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems a bit weird to me. But I know, you know, to be your own. That's just crazy to talk. Me. Yeah. <laughs> so and how much of this? Um, so when did you begin? I mean, the actual, you know, yeah. page one blank. When was that? Yeah, I think uh, when I left my, I uh, had a position at the University of Manitoba, October 2014, and I took that, that summer to, uh, you know, not do anything very productive, frankly. But after that, I thought, you know, this is my chance to, to do this thing that I've always wanted to do. And uh, I actually started out writing uh, in bed, which sounds ridiculous, but I was just um, really pushing back on the idea of who am I to try to write a book, you know? And uh, so I, I told myself, I'll do it while I'm sitting in bed with the covers over me where no one can see me. And I'll just do it until I, well, 
until I start telling people, and then it's too late, then it's out. Yeah. <laughs> and then if something doesn't happen, then I don't have to live with that. But uh, you're not alone. I mean, many <laughs> famous writers that work like that, and, and in more contemporary, you know, uh, uh, is it Melissa McMahon, the one that wrote uh, Wait, uh, Wait Until I'll Be Home Before Dark, you know, mm -hmm. who was uh, the comedian Pat Oswalt's wife, and she wrote this book and sadly passed away before it was finished. but. Her, her office was her bed. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was in there all day. Yeah. And then how did the, you know, this thing that's interrupted us all and made us all pivot, was this an opportunity for you then to, you know, was this during COVID, you know, starting in 2020, were you bringing it to, uh, sending it out to, to the publishers and stuff that mm -hmm. had already been completed by the time everything locked down? Yeah, I think I was lucky in a way because COVID was so terribly hard and uh, I knew that I had a book deal of that uh, November. So um, I, you know, I was, I was, had this great news and then I could set to the more transactional tasks of, you know, satisfying the requirements of my publisher and creating a website and doing some of these things that you just, you know, you need to do when that happens. And uh, so it was productive in that case. But in terms of the second novel, you know, in terms of, you know, progress of the second novel, it was, it, it slowed down quite a bit because, sure, I, yeah. you know, it was just, it's just that brain fog when you're, you're not interacting with people in the same way and you just feel so utterly disconnected and kind of grieving for all the things that you used to do and they're now gone and you, you know, you just, you know, you feel a bit lost, so. So, I mean, you must have, you know, had that as, as anyone who wants to put what they create out into the world, you know, of uh, how it would be received and so on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you did it in the old school kind of way, right? You generated a manuscript yeah, and then you sent it I didn't. Publishes. Yeah, I didn't do anything right. You know, I didn't write an article well, for a magazine. You did something right. <laughs> well, I did. Yes, I did that right. Yeah, that's publishers. true. But leading up to it, you know how they say to get something published in a literary journal or you know get right, something yeah. into a magazine. I I didn't write a short story. Well, you know, I just went and wrote a novel out of nowhere, as far as anybody else is concerned. And how much of a how much of a hit on your ego was that? You know. All of them, Stephen King talk about the piles of rejection letters and so on. Did you? Yeah, you could feel kind of like a crazy person in the sense that, you know, I'm going to do all of this work. I'm going to put my heart and soul into it. I'm, I'm going to go to Nairobi of all places and I'm going to conduct research. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go through all this personal excavation to make this thing as rich and as vivid and uh, as powerful as I can as a human being. And then nobody may want it. Yeah. And nobody may care. And uh, so, um, yeah, there's a real moment of, or extended moment of turning inward and just saying, I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know, that's it. And, you know, it's just, it's giving yourself a chance. Yeah. But I mean, in a real way, you know, in a world that is, you know, with the internet and stuff is quite, you know, superficial and performative, you know, you yeah. have, you can say that now, who you are is, and it's just that, mm -hmm. you know, Publish author, yeah. you know, many people don't get there, and so that's part of who you are. And then you put who you are into this book, and yeah. you've created people. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's surprising and delighting about this book is, you know, I say the same very often in theater, and it's quite ironic because, you know, mostly I make my living as a stand up comic, which is about one person going up, mm -hmm. and if you don't like it, it's yeah. just that one thing over and over and over again. <laughs> and so much of theater and so much of novels is I, 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 right. you know, 300 pages of a single first person narrative and you better kind of get used to this voice, which is often just a more misanthropic or a more a successful version of the uh, successful version of the writer. You have done something quite uh, traditional and in this, world uh, quite unique, which is, it's a very uh, old school novel in the best way, is we follow the lives of many characters mm -hmm. across many places, and they're all unique. And so who are you in there? Mm -hmm. You know, because we have this one character, Devin, who's, who's central, you know, I maybe not the main character, but you know, as an Oscar, he would be the, the you know, the actor, and then, you know, everyone else is supporting. So 
are you, who are you in there? Yeah, um, with four different voices, I mean, it is, uh, you know, the most complicated kind of novel that you can write uh, to have all these different people telling the story. Um, and I had to, because I had decided early on that it was going to be written this way, I had to think very carefully about how everyone's going to sound. And so that's the, that's the topic of voice that people talk about in, in literature. And uh, I think usually authors just feel it, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're lucky if they do. But because I was going to be telling it by four, through four people, I had to think very carefully about the voice yeah. because I wanted them to be distinct. So what I did is I redefined voice for myself because, you know, even though I have a, you know, I have a, a major in literature for my undergrad, um, you know, when people talk about voice in a, in a dictionary and they're talking about a state of mind of a character, the word choice, the, yeah. you know, the tone, the mood, you know, uh, that's all well and good, but how do you actually apply that? And so I said to myself that voice is a person's personal music. And that's how I made it make meaning for me because I do have a, a bit of a background in music and I can think about things like pace yeah. and rhythm and I can think liter uh, literally and I can think metaphorically and that really kind of we opened it up. A, we all have a melody. People have a sound and, and that goes beyond accents and things like that. People have a sound just like bands have a sound, you know, you haven't heard that song before but you know it's so and so. And uh, I'm not saying that we all need to go out and break that stuff down and get really technical about it, but I did spend some time sort of creating a typology of voice for the, faint, the, the, the main characters. And so Devin, for example, is uh, very percussive. You know, he has a, a bit of a, you know, a b -b -b -k -t -t to him. And he has and a, a bit sort of clanging and bashing through life. He's a drum kit. Uh, has very shorter, has shorter sentences, and he's a bit of a drum kit, where his father is the polar opposite. He has more of a sort of uh, Malcolm Gladwell feel. He has very long, luxurious uh, sentences that go on, and they take more presence on the page as well, which is kind of like reading music. I mean, voice to me is not just something that you hear, it's something that you read. You're reading a novel, you're reading music, and that shows up for me at least. And then, of course, everybody kind of falls in within those sort of polar opposites. You know, as for me, I'm, I'm kind of in all of them. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I really like Devin's sound a lot, and uh, I do hear myself in, in him. But I can also pull off some coal. You know, I could give you a long, luxurious sentence and, and enjoy that as well. So it's, um, when I talk about personal excavation, that's what yeah. I talk about. You sort of... You're revealing yourself to yourself, but at the same time as an author, keeping yourself out of the story, which I feel very, you know, strongly and, about. And so I'm always very cognizant when I do these that I, I, I never find it terribly helpful, um, you know, that people attend something that they can do at home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is to read the back of a book and get the plot synopsis and all those <laughs> kind of things. And uh, I also, I, I really uh, value the experience of discovery. You know, and I think we really live in a world where you watch a movie trailer and you're like, okay, that was a good movie, yeah. right? I don't have to see that, you know, and, uh, you know, and so we, you know, but also I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the idea that both we want to introduce this work to keep most people who haven't read it and give a sense of it, right? So I'm just trying to strike that balance. So maybe this is the way to do it is, is if you can just introduce the characters to us and the, and the way that they interact with each other, like a band might. Yeah. So give us, you know, keep going Devin with kind of the drums. Yeah. And this character is Devin's, you know, what their relation to is not just musically, but in, yeah. in familiarly. Yes. Could you give us a little of that? And that maybe could set us up to hearing a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've taken a, a bunch of characters and I've given them a, fi a family dynamic. Um, and so Devin is a young man of 24 who, uh, you know, dreams of being a songwriter. And he has two parents, Cole and Julia, who don't support this dream. And they've living with this young man who doesn't have a job, hasn't finished high school. And so conflict is sort of boiling at home and they don't know what to do. And so it's sort of untenable. And then we've got his sister, Lily, who is um, a huge fan of Devin. They were at one time extremely close, almost like twins. And uh, suddenly 
you know, Devin has uh, got a grandfather who is a believer in tough love, gives Devin a one-way ticket to Nairobi, Kenya to go and learn how to be a man, you know, in the tradition, this logic of tough love where we try to encourage people through a kind of self-help towards taking responsibility for their own actions. And I'm not, and I'm not you, proposing that we take that on, but are that's his- you going to introduce this epistle when you read? <laughs> the famous letter than the book? Oh. Because, you know, do you mind if I bring it up? No, no. Okay. Just, 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 because to me, it was, you know, it, not only would I describe it as a reader as, as, as uh, riveting, mm -hmm. right? But um, emotional, emotionally, I wonder if I, I just got, Concerned because uh, the internet is here. I believe that is done electronically. There we go. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's 2022. So if you give me a second, I have to apologize to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> if people who couldn't be bothered coming uh, didn't hear a little bit. I know there are other reasons you're not here. So <laughs> don't send an email to McNally, please. <laughs> this hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, because uh, you know this. I I don't know if you guys know this. Um, uh, I grew up in a family. <laughs> <laughs> Notice to Devin Rush, right? Twenty fifteen, nearly six months ago, your father and I met with you to discuss your future. You were informed that you had to finish your high school credits and get a job. Since that time, you have done nothing to improve yourself and you deserted your schoolwork. This then is written notification that things must change immediately. We insist on a signed declaration for you considering what you are prepared to do. You must decide and report to your father within one week on whether or not you will complete your high school credits or find a full-time job. If you need new clothes or transportation, we will pay all costs. If you want to remain as you are and decline to accept and abide by rule number one, then you must find a new place to live. If this is your choice, we will do everything possible to help you find a place and help you get settled. The current situation cannot continue any longer. You're an adult and must choose one of the options below. I will make the request that changes and will make a total effort towards school or finding a full-time job, signed Devin, or check mark, I will not follow the above request and will look for another home, signed Devin, Devin, and then it says from granddad, mm -hmm. who seemed to have uh, grown up reading a lot of Ayn Rand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, that's quite a shock. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think, you know, I would imagine for most of us listening, that's kind of hard to hear. Yeah. You know, I'm sure if Brian Pallister was here, he would stand <laughs> up <laughs> and ask for a copy to send to every man at Chalban. But for most of it, that seems a bit severe and, um, and cruel and often, unfortunately, has the opposite effect on a young psyche than the intended one. Yeah. Which it's, is to it's, destroy it indicates a communication back, uh, breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's quite an inciting incident. And mm -hmm. does that have a home in, in your world? Uh, no, I can't say that I, you know, uh, was sent away to a foreign country to grow into, a, a, you know, an adult person. You can tell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I just really am interested in the idea of control or the illusion of control and the idea of what we do with other people. And I think, you know, tough love is just something that interests me because, you know, this idea that we're going to break someone down in order to build them up is kind of fascinating to me. And, um, yeah, I think it was just something that would sustain me. Yeah. And just, you know, throughout the novel, just picking away a little bit at the logic embedded in that total concept. And then, you know, and, and it, uh, just as a piece of writing uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a literary choice, it's quite fascinating, right? Because it is, by definition, uh, completely expositional, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, as we read it, we can anticipate, even though you've really given us not a lot of clues as to how this book is going, that it's not going to be fulfilled in the way that Grandpa, mm -hmm. you know, imagines. And so we're like, 
yeah. you know, oh, oh dear, you know, yeah. that's kind of what I thought as a mm -hmm. parent, oh dear, yeah. you know, and I even thought, you know, the idea of crafting a letter like that and giving mm -hmm. it to a person is just, you know, very, very profound and, mm -hmm. and raw, you mm -hmm. know, and so, um, yeah, I mean, you want to, you know, and if you need to give a little bit of context to your passage yeah. and oh, stuff, okay. you know, go yes. ahead. Okay. Well, you know, I had to make some decisions because there's four people uh, telling the story. Uh, we don't want to be here all night, I'm sure. But uh, so we'll start ladies first. I've uh, chosen a little bite here from Julia, which is the mother. And um, we'll get a little bit of the background on, uh, you know, what's happened just before this is Julia's uh, taking care of her father when he's sick and uh, she takes care of him at home and he dies of cancer. And meanwhile, she has this man, Cole, who later becomes her husband, but during this, they just know each other and he's sort of being there for her and kind of ingratiating himself into her life. And- um, And this, this, this part takes place in a, in a, in a place called uh, Winnipeg, Canada. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. And that's a real place. That's a real yeah. place. Yeah, as it turns out. So we'll get a little of the dynamics of their relationship and what's important to Julia, even though she doesn't know that, you know, because as, as all good readers know, you don't trust your narrator. You should eat, he said. He found tomato soup in a can. He heated it in the microwave and opened a sleeve of soda crackers. He, spread the, he placed the spread in front of me and said, I like taking care of you. When I put the spoon to my mouth, something was missing. The bowl's warm, I said, but the soup's cold. The seasons changed. On an uncommonly warm winter afternoon, Cole leaned out a window he was cleaning. Then all at once, his head dipped, and he pulled his body back in, bonking his head on the windowsill. I hurried over and put a hand to his head. He put his arms around me and planted a kiss. The word that came to mind was textbook. The kiss spoke in whispers of fear and compensation. I led him to my bed where his traipsing tongue became a plug in my throat, lovemaking by suffocation. He pulled off his clothes and draped them on the back of my chair. He did the same with my pants. After he gently slid them off, his neatness gave me a shiver. To describe the sex, I'd have to say greatest hits album. Standard riffs delivered with vigor. Can't say it was bad. It was a proper romp, like I'd been somewhere and spent money. I wish I could say I was breathless afterwards, that I screamed because he'd hit the nerve near the root. But it was more like pinball. Press the button to start her up. Rock machine with hips and try not to drain the ball too soon. Who was I to complain? I still slept under my father's duvet, a girl with moldy bread and filthy fingernails carrying an anvil-sized fatigue, yet she dreams of living. I told myself what any girl does when considering her future. How much scope can any one man have? <laughs> Cole's lips were parted. A fine layer of sweat coated him. Maybe we should do a date, he'd said. I was thinking, we have. We hadn't. What we did was let Cole take care of me. He sat up on, he sat up with his legs off the bed's edge, his hair pleasantly mussed into standing waves. He pecked me on the forehead and washed up in the bathroom. When he returned, he lay again, this time generously alongside me, sumptuously close. I felt his eyelashes graze the end of my nose before he sank into sleep. Morning came, and feeling as though I'd rested better than I had in a while, I opened my eyes. The window was open, and the air was full and sweet. Beside me, Cole was splayed, with his fingers cupping his scrotum. I made him breakfast. I whipped cream. I cooked sausages in one pan and, pa and pancakes with blueberries in another. Cole was behind me, with arms around my waist. Then, when breakfast was served, he was hypnotized. We spent the afternoon shopping an outdoor market. With a light arm around me, Cole talked about beets and Swiss chard, sharing my excitement for cooking, or at least eating. Going home, we zoomed along Pemina Highway. I said, I used to want to act. The median swept past his window. That was my number one dream growing up. Hmm? 
when I was acting, I never had an issue being myself, you know? I thought acting was a put on, he'd said. I think of it more as a filter, I said. A part comes through a person. He seemed puzzled. I tried some improv and community club acting. People said good things, but I thought something was holding me back. I couldn't quite get to the level of rawness I wanted. Guess we'll never know. By dinner, an edge crept into my mood, like the chill in the late summer breeze when leaves start to drop and float on lakes like shards of rust. I remembered swimming at our cottage at Lac Lou the second weekend of October. Mom was in a turtleneck. She stayed on the shore with a towel folded over her arm. Dad was on the dock ready with a camera. I did a jump off the end and then made a clenched climb back up the ladder. I thought about those days at the lake often in my grief. Then on a Saturday, Cole asked if I'd like to go to the beach. It was mid-June. He packed the van with beer, sandwiches, and CDs. At the beach, there were 11 cars in the parking lot. The sun was high, the air was warm, and my mood brightened. I took Cole's hand and we walked, passing young people. We laid the blanket and popped a beer. I pulled my skirt in tight around my thighs. Cole looked at me, care to swim? Waves far out curled over a sandbar. I don't know, I said, might be cold. He vaulted to his feet and jogged to the water's edge. His white skin glowed against blue steel as he poked the water with his toe. He turned back squinting, you should come. I waved for him to go on without me. He bounded in, water splashed around his ankles and thighs. Eventually he dived. His heels disappeared under water and three seconds later his head bobbed out. He waved and then swam deeper with a breaststroke. When I looked again, he was treading water. Come on. You go ahead, I said. What? I said, that's okay. You should. I could see his arms working. If you don't, you'll regret it. Besides, you don't want to keep me hanging, right? All right, I'd said. It was a thumbs up from Cole. I pulled off my sundress. Water met my feet and I flinched at the chill. That's ridiculous, I said. Cole only smiled. I crept in further. Cold flew up my shins. The breeze off the lake made it worse. Muscles constricted from kneecaps to crotch to waist. I hugged myself and stepped along the gentle descent of the sand below. I'm getting tired, he said. Dive. I started whispering to myself, one, two. What's that? I'm talking myself through it. Be with me, he said. Waves slapped around his jawline. It's fine once you're in. We married a year later, honeymooned in Fiji, in a hut built on stilts surrounded by water. See the woman admiring the ultra blue? She steps down into surf overlooking the future. Even so, there was a chill. All I know of love was that it was not evasion. Not getting in would have been harder. Thank you. Yeah. You know, there's so much of that in the book, you know, and, uh, you know, you've taken some of my classes and we spend a lot of time talking about the breathing and poetry and stuff. And, you know, there's there's so much in there that resonates with me. And, you know, I feel that, you know, the, the, the stirrings of other writers, you know, a little bit of Roth, Philip Roth, and, and very much, you know, especially when you talk about, um, you know, rhythm and music and, you know, a bit of jazz and stuff is, the, you know, is the beats, you know, and that lovely... Uh, you know, and some of those lovely phrases you do where you, you know, you change the, the metaphoric meaning without it getting a bit clunky, you know, and any, any crew is good at it too, you know, and, and anvil sized, you know, and uh, what is an anvil sized? Um, fatigue. Fatigue, you know, and so you get the weight of the anvil, you know, bearing down and then, but also the size, right? And, and you do that quite a lot. And it's a lovely, um, there's an, you know, there's um, a sun spilling over a river, you know, blood orange sangria, you know, it's, you know, almost like a little um, haiku, you know, and, and then in, in Nairobi in, in Kenya, you know, we find park beside the goat meat, the Lionel Richie posted, half buried beneath the vinyl records. You know, you, you evoke in these lovely, uh, bright sentences, you know, so much of how we all intersect with each other and how much of the, 
detritus around us is a combination of so many cultures and peoples and, mm -hmm. and so on. And, uh, you know, and this idea of going very, very far away to the other side of the world to find your way back home. I mean, it really resonates with all these kind of things that I think make her really, really, really good novel. And, uh, you know, you, you succeed so well in that, you know, mm -hmm. there's actually a lovely, um, genuine piece of poetry I wanted to, to bring in and maybe you just read it because it's quite uh, short, um, quite near the end. And it really stuck out for me. I think it's in chapter seven or chapter six. <laughs> you know I, can, I can set it up while you're flipping. Okay, yeah, you yeah, set you it go up. Ahead. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, you take your time. Well, you know, I did, uh, <laughs> I actually did uh, fold it. Oh, there we go. But I'm just not sure of the 10 copies sitting here, which one I folded it in. <laughs> there it is, you there you go. Okay, I'm so there- I'm not as dumb as I look. Yeah. So uh, Julia and Cole uh, do mushrooms in one of the scenes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a lot of fun to, to try to write from that kind of point of view. But anyway, she's... she's uh, These are the ones you don't get at Sobeys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So... Um, Unless it's the one in Grant, and then you have to ask for William. And <laughs> <laughs> that's a different story. So uh, she's starting to feel it, and that's what this represents. But she's also reflecting on the state of her marriage, and, and she's not feeling very good about it. And she's sort of centered on the word verb. And verb is one, you know, kind of one of my favorite words in, in here. But anyway, so she kind of goes on a little mental tangent here, and this is the poem in the, in the middle of this thing. Verb, V. V is a crack in the molding the head of a viper, a toddler stroked arrow pointing to hell. Verve is the varied quake in your voice as you shrug off old skin, air crackles with spirited sparks of fancy, standing each hair on. Do you feel anything? Lovely. What about this, uh, you know, I love, uh... I love titles. You know, we were joking at dinner that uh, I'm not sure that the uh, death of a salesman would have won a Pulitzer had Arthur Miller stuck with his original title and conceit, which was the inside of his head. <laughs> and that uh, the entire set was going to be Willie Loman's brain with a thing for the cerebral. You know, we would yeah. be talking about, I would be trying to remember the title of a play that closed after two performances in yeah. 1960 on Broadway. And so titles are important, you know, for yeah. a lot of reasons. And so, uh, you know, it's a, you know uh, the, the, the fate of a book can be changed by the title to some degree. And they stick in their head, the catcher and the rye and so on. And, and then on Catch 22 was, um, was uh, Catch 18 oh. because, uh, it's made up, but the catch 22 where you couldn't get out of the military, you know, unless you were crazy. And if you were crazy, you know, and so on, uh, was actually called Catch 18 by um, Joseph Heller. Mm -hmm. And then the publisher said that uh, Leon Uris is bringing out a book about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising called Mila 18. Mm -hmm. So you're not calling it. So pick another number. Yeah. And Heller <laughs> said about, about 22. And they said, it's a hit. Yeah. And so um, bombing the moon, where did that come from? Bomb in the Moon comes from the Cold War, uh, the early Cold War, 1950 to 1959, where um, there was a rumor coming out of Russia that they were thinking about nuking the moon uh, as a show of force to the Americans, because as you know, there were, would have been an arms race going on, proliferation of nuclear weapons. And uh, so Eisenhower feeling a little uh, like maybe he's going to be outdone or feeling a little inadequate with their, uh, you know, nuclear capabilities, uh, consulted a, a respected physicist and asked, can we nuke the moon? You know, and so the whole idea, this was called A119 was the uh, proposal. So this was a real thing. Uh, happily, they didn't do it. It would have uh, <laughs> ended in a kind of environmental epoch that we would have never recovered from. But uh, and there would have been trouble if they didn't hit the moon. I mean, what if they what if they didn't actually hit it? And then what if they did hit it? Um, but this was an actual idea, and the, and the high the idea is a show of force. And so for me, this is a kind of an analogous idea of um, tough love. 
yeah. you know, my way or the highway kind of a thing. It's a form of bombing the moon. It's a form of bombing the moon, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's in, yeah, and, and how ironic, and so tragically ironic that you know, if you bring this up, we can't have any, it's going to bring up the word Russia and yeah. uh, nuclear. And we, you know, a year ago, we would have you said, well, how, what an interesting piece of historic trivia. And now all of us, <laughs> anxiety rises in us, you know, and so. Well, tough know. love is actually a political strategy as well. Yeah. You know, people yeah. are using in the parlance uh, words like sanctions, but uh, it is a it is a political strategy to well, encourage Simone, self Simone, self Simone love. Veal, you remember Simone Veal, the, yeah. you know the French uh, philosopher. You know, and she said that uh, uh, force, uh, by definition, is to treat a person like a thing. Yeah, you know, and that's what we do with tough love, isn't mm -hmm. it? We we treat somebody like a a, a piece of material that's going to come out the other side shaped. Mm -hmm. in the way that we prefer right you know and any force thing like that mm -hmm. tends to break right you know and so this attempt to do this uh to this young person sends him to the other side of the world but the other side of the world is a big place but you she you chose uh nairobi and, and you know mm -hmm. the nation of kenya why 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 that nation um well i think that kenya is a place that's um held a lot of mystery and kind of beauty in my imagination for many years and uh you know i also thought that i needed a place that would shake devon up in a kind of a political way and uh, in 2007 they had had their democratic elections and it became quite bloody unfortunately um, and, you know, this may sound uh, familiar, but, you know, concerns about vote rigging and uh, police brutality and things like this. And, um, you know, I guess I kind of predicted because I wrote this or finished this before uh, the elections in 2017 in Nairobi and it did erupt in some violence, less so. Um, but at least 100 people were, were, were injured and about 17 people were killed. Um, because, you know, uh, President Kenyatta is, you know, suspected or widely believed to uh, be cheating, you know, the, the electoral process. And so um, between those two things, it just seemed like that's that's my place. And had you been there before? No, but I went to to go see it as I, as I was writing it. I got sort of the core story down. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I what I what I needed to know and kind of went in with a kind of journalistic kind of approach. And in the book, you describe Devin's experience or anybody's experience with that kind of uh, one of the characters he meets when he arrives. Uh, you know, is um, this idea of um, culture shock. Mm -hmm. um, and the Nairobi, and I believe, is the one that, um, the Kenya is the one that tells him what he is experiencing, which is that it, it, it falls on you like a pile of bricks. Yes. You know, and. Um, you know, it is quite an experience when we when we do. You know, so much of the world is homogeneous now, and and, and American culture is so ubiquitous. But once in a while, we land in a place that is to us quite strange in our yeah. experience. Um, how did you feel when you first arrived? And what was that experience of culture shock? Yeah, it wasn't my worst experience of culture shock. That was in Morocco, uh, but uh, you know. I, I just think that there's something so, you know, I don't always like this word, relatable about the fish out of water story, which this is, you know, and, uh, you know, it kind of reflects our shared humanity as we grapple with new uh, cultures and languages and that kind of thing. I mean, I, um, you know, I'm so grateful that I was able to go because, um, you know, yes, you can do a lot of research. Uh, you can go on the internet, you can go to the library, you can do a lot of things. Um, but, you know, part of it is just feeling it and being transformed by it. And I think that that is really the key to what I hope is the richness in the detail. I mean, yes, you can put the details in there, uh, but so many of those I would not have known if I had just, you know, done the other things, but also just, you know, I've learned to listen to what's going on in my own head. 
you know, the good, the bad, and the petty for material. And, you know, it's, it, it is like that. It's a wallop. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I was in Morocco, I was, I was physically ill. I had to remove myself and go sit down in a chair and have a cup of tea and kind of recover because there's just no preparation for that kind of thing. You know, in Nairobi, I, I think by then, you know, I had traveled around quite a bit and I sort of, you know, could kind of hold myself and talk to myself with some kind of, you know, help, but yeah, yeah sure. it's a it's a poignant moment. And when I think, you know, when I think about these things, and these are very uh, au courant discussions right now about, you know, staying in your lane and all yes. these kind of things. And, you know, um, it's it's a long topic, and I think it's an unfolding conversation, yes. and it's very dynamic. Yeah. And so I don't think that we can ever come down to have a set of rules or so no. on. But I mean, one thing I experience, you know, in in, in moving and in, in, in crossing, you know, between, you know, a, 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 a position of, of some uh, privilege in a society and a gender and to, an, to another, you know, uh, and then being exposed to those who have not taken that journey, perhaps uh, attempting, you know, because the story is interesting or for whatever reason, uh, in their imagination to create, you know, say like a transgender story, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I will read and watch them and sometimes, you know, they can be quite moving and so on. But at the same time, it's what you said, mm -hmm. which is, you know, in the old spy movies, you know, the guy does everything right and then he picks up the fork like someone from Frankfurt, you know, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's not often that fatal for our choices. Right. <laughs> no. Someone will send you a Facebook message that you're a piece of shit. But other than that, <laughs> there are often not really any enduring consequences. But at the same time, I think that is important because I may read it and enjoy it, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to embrace it and return to it or maybe share it with my community because right. I know there's that little distancing. Right. And you can capture that mm -hmm. as an outsider. I mean, the red badge of courage is one of the finest anti-war novels ever written and really gives us a real sense of what the American Civil War must have been like, but Stephen Crane was nowhere near it. Mm -hmm. You know, Defoe was a journal of the plague year, which is an almost documentary account of the plague in 1665. Um, it's written by Defoe when he was there. Defoe was four years old when that happened. It's all research and imagination. Yeah, and so I, we can do it, but it's just, yeah. it's a lot, it's harder, isn't it? Especially it's a lot, now, it's a lot harder. To get and, your yeah. shit together and yeah. your facts straight, right? It's, we right. have a tremendous responsibility. I was, I was lucky in the sense that when we were there, we had some friends, John and Hannah, who are Kenyans and who took us around for two or three days to all the sites that I needed to see. So, you know, these descriptions that you're that you're seeing of one of the you know largest slums in Africa, I was there, not with them, but with people who actually lived there. And so, you know, I I was there and I saw it. And, you know, um, I think as long as we educate ourselves in the spirit of appreciation or cultural appreciation. And, uh, you know, I, in a way, I felt like I had sensitivity, you know, people helping sensitivity get uh, data gathering yeah, and information yeah. gathering because, and we didn't, you know, work the whole time. We hung out, we cooked dinner together and we, you know, went and saw some elephants or, you know, whatever. We, we, we had, a, had an experience that was all our own. And that's what bombing the moon is. I mean, it, it's, a, it's about a family. It's about a young man and his family. And he, he goes to Nairobi and he grapples with it. And that, that is uh, a relatable human experience, and that is the purpose of art. In my in my opinion, is is the shared humanity that comes through art. Absolutely, and the and the other thing that's very resonant, and I, I think um, relatable um, in in this community, you know, where you said it, is this notion of um, a, a child, even an adult child. You know, we call them children. My daughter is eighty nine. You know, she's about to eighty nine. <laughs> I slipped up your lips. you almost died. Um, 29, mm -hmm. but she's still my baby. You yeah. know what I mean? And especially um, when they go away, you know, my, our daughter went to Jasper 
And if I didn't hear for her, from her for three days, you know, I have a very vivid imagination and yeah. it's quite morbid. And so in this case, Devin goes away because he's, he, there's, it's, a, it's a process of estrangement. Right. And then there becomes some grief and then a desire to find out if he's okay. And that is thwarted by technology and distance. And we create the situation of estrangement, mm -hmm. you know, and this is a community that, that has a tremendous amount of grief around people that are missing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm involved in looking for some of those people. And sometimes, thank God, you know, they're not completely missing in the worst way we can imagine, but they are missing to their families and emotionally or connectively, mm -hmm. you know, physically and so on. But uh, at some point, the news that they are safe somewhere right. uh, can be delivered to somebody and that that can be good. Mm -hmm. But that idea of that, where does that come from inside you? That the idea of being separated from somebody or something you love and estranged and, and that tremendous hole that's there as you try to navigate life while they're gone and that the, how time passes right. when we're waiting for somebody to come back and not knowing if they do or not. Those are very, very powerful things. Where did you draw from to get all that out? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that if, I think for me, you know, I have always felt like I was a little bit on the outside, you know? And I know I'm not the only one, right? But I, I feel like, you know, I've always been a pretty creative person and have my own way of thinking and expressing. And uh, I guess I had a perception that that was different and, and maybe it is and maybe that, maybe it's not. Um, and I think that, you know, I am the child of much older parents of other people who had children my age. You know, my, my mom had me when she was in her forties. And uh, I, have a, I have a brother here who is, you know, about 13 years older than me. So in some ways, I think I was a little bit like an only child. And, you know, that's a, that's a different way of growing up. You're not an only child, but in a way you are. And my parents were much older than other parents of, you know, the kids of the same age. And I guess I felt, you know, at times that they didn't really get me or, you know, understand the world that I was living in and coming through. And so, you know, um, and I'm also really drawn to this idea of, you know, the farther you go away, the closer you get to yourself. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm not one of those people around New Year's Eve where I start thinking about what I'm going to do better in my life. I do that when I'm away on a trip. And I don't know why, but I do feel like, you know, I'm getting to know Nancy a little bit better and things sort of, I uh, form some clarity about certain things in my life. And I, and that's part of the souvenir that I bring home with me from a trip. It's like, you know, what am I going to do differently about that? And so, you know, you put this together and you have someone like Devin Rush, who is very alive for me. All four of these characters are like people to me. Um, and uh, he's gone out and, you know, I suppose I am taking advantage of this boomer versus millennial thing that uh, is going on, at least in the media, you know. Um, or he's going out and uh, they don't understand him. And, uh, you know, yeah, maybe he's not working and maybe he's entitled and spoiled. And yeah, by the way, he is. But he's also part of a generation of people who can imagine how the world ends. And that's not something that I grew up with. I, no. I didn't fear a ball of fire or flooding or whatever. You know, I have climate anxiety now, um, but I didn't grow up with that. And so, I think there's room in the story to feel for the parents, but there's also room to feel for the young. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And they have something to say, you know, um, no, always, you know, my daughter would probably send me a text and I'd say, uh, how'd your little book reading go while the world is on fire? Right. You know, so they, yeah. have, <laughs> they can be a little bit tougher. <laughs> um, so would you, um, you, you know, we're, 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 we're winding down, but I, I would like to open that up if anyone, you know, is anxious to, to ask or, or have a question. A and then we'll do a little reading oh, okay. to, to close it up. But okay. let's, let's grab one question because I, I, I would love to hear from the people if somebody has something to say. And then I'll get you to close up with a little read. Anyone have anything to, to say? 
Uh, we did have one question from the internet that we could start off with, if you'd like, and then go to live. All right, internet. Perfect. So, can will I, you translate for the internet? I, I will give it my Okay, best but thank the internet for their question. <laughs> Absolutely. The okay. internet is embodied in the form of Kara, who starts off saying, Great dress, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, thank you. And uh, it kind of builds on what you two were talking about as well. Carol was wondering, uh, your book is based in Kenya, and Carol was wondering if your travels to that part of the world were the most impactful travels that you've been. Well, in a way, yes, because I had so much invested above and beyond what I normally have invested when I go on a trip, you know, as in this novel. But uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things about that trip was uh, this, the extreme uh, disparity between rich and poor. And it really is a thing to contend with. I mean, you can read about it, you can watch things all you want, but in, until you're kind of there and you can smell it and you can taste it and you can see it and you can talk to the people and you can gain their confidence to the extent that they will tell you their stories, it is, um, something that will never leave you. And, you know, as a writer, it's just the most invaluable thing because you're writing something and, and the act of writing is, a, is, a, is an act of change, but you're also changing as you're changing, you're changing as you're writing. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's just nothing that can replace going there. We don't all have that privilege, but yeah, I can't say enough good things about that. Wonderful. All right, so let's, uh, well, we'll close this up with you. Okay. And so before we do that, I'll do my little kind of thanks before so that, you know, you have the floor. Okay. And so I will thank you all for coming uh, so much. And um, Nancy's going to take us out and then John, you know, will have a little instruction as to, as to how you may go and purchase uh, this book and, and speak some more with Nancy. And if you think of anything to say, I'm sure you'll be happy to do that yes. and she'll sign the copy uh, on, in the unlikely event uh, you're interested in a copy of this book <laughs> uh, meet me over at the, at the photocopier in the back and I'll run one off for you no charge all right uh, so give her a nice warm round of applause I'll embarrass her slightly by saying that she was a little bit nervous when she talked to me last night, but I thought she did an extraordinary job and didn't show it. On the desk. All right, so this last reading is, is Devin, and uh, he spends most of the novel uh, in Nairobi, of course, and he's with his friend Kasim, who he's met there, and um, they have just gone to visit Kasim's grandmother, and Devin's curious because his the grandmother seems to rest with her eyes closed. He's talking to Kasim about his parents and uh, Kasim's dad had, uh, they were very poor coming up and his dad used to leave a lot to uh, go to work, to find work. And uh, he would go uh, longer and longer each time. And then one day left and didn't come back. And so they're talking about that. And Devin is outraged to hear this story, you know, um, and so we get a little bit of their friendship. We get a little challenge to the concept of tough love in a, in a, in a roundabout way. And we get uh, Dee's love of music. This is Devin right off the top. He didn't deserve you guys, I said. He left, you can't let someone get away with that. Then, Kasim said, almost three years later, he came back. His eyes cast out over nearby buildings. He was poor as ever. When I saw him standing outside her mother's house, it was sad and beautiful. He wanted to come home, just he did not know how. As mother walked to him, his face changed. She kissed his palms. I know because we watched through the window. Something was happening to us as well. We huddled together, arms around each other. We knew that he had been close all that time caring about us through relatives, aware of our whereabouts. To see him on the other side of a few concrete slabs, incredible. When he kissed mother, we ran out. 
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How did everyone else react? They threw a party, of course. A man with an orange cart at the roadside waved. Kasim gave him a salute. For the poor and unemployed, Kasim said, there is little feeling of contribution. You live to die another day. It's dehumanizing. It divorces people from themselves and from their loved ones. So when a man finds that he has lost his influence, he leaves to find it elsewhere. It was not easy when he returned. We had to relearn ourselves. But as my mother used to say, if the moon loves you, why worry about the stars? A Boda Boda driver pulled up beside us. A little girl clamped herself to the back of what might have been her brother. Kasim gave her the, the Queen of England's uh, wave. You know, Devon, he said, I shudder to think where any of us would be if we received what we deserve. While idling in traffic, I asked Kasim about his grandmother's eyes. He said that she'd taken the bus to work every day for years. One day in 2000 and something, two men attempted to bomb the US embassy. They couldn't get past the gate and panicked first and threw grenades. The sound brought people in neighboring buildings to the windows. The explosives in the truck blew. The blast took down the office building next door and sent window shards from the bus into his grandmother's eyes. Kasim's voice quaked a little in the retelling, especially about her being buried in the fallout, alone, taken to hospital, not knowing where she was for three days. Let's change the subject, he said. He asked about my process for writing music. I said I didn't really have one, his eyes waited. I said, strumming chords, humming melodies, I kind of get lost, much of it seems accidental. He was bouncing, music is meant to share, he said, sing one for me. If I do, you have to tell me what you th really think. You have to be brutally honest. He looked at me strangely. I would see your music as a gift. Tell me, why would I be brutal? With Kasim, I was comfortable exploring Nairobi's music scene. In May, I found a venue called Carnival Grounds. Kasim and I went one night. I expected him to know the place, but he was rubbernecking like me. Heaped on the stage, mounds of blinking audio equipment, tables and chairs scattered in an arc like a cathedral. We took a table next to a guy with long braids pulled back in a ponytail. He wore sunglasses, even though it was dark, and he had a glass of dark beer in front of him. His arms were on the table, hands flat, like he was holding the table down. The place was filling up, glasses clinked, voices rose, puh, 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 a man on stage spat into the microphone, another tweet, buttons on a synth. Then the lights narrowed to a spotlight on the stage. The crowd fell silent. This is gonna be good, I whispered. A woman walked into the light, her hair a Medusa mop of copper curls, red leather pants up to her armpits. She raised one arm, brought it down, bam, a seven piece band, convulsive percussion jabbing into the bottom part of lung where I rarely draw breath. Electrifying wall to wall beats. The singer sidestepped across the stage, dragging the microphone stand. Her hair whipped and her lips opened like drum cymbals. The wall behind the band lit up and images from Nairobi played on a screen. screen Slum shots, downtown core, poverty contra contrasted with mansions, designed to stir an audience. But it was her voice that really did it. Pure power. She could pull off a high octane glissando and drop back into a chorus like nothing happened. It was like a feast. I didn't know which shade of cool to save her first. I swiveled around to see Kasim, ready to say, they're ripping up this set. Lights from the stage lit his face. He had a strange glare in his eye. I knew he was thinking about politics. I wanted to get his attention and say, look at this. Just once, couldn't he slough off the layers of virtue and get back to fun? I turned away as the guitarist ran his fingers in rapture along the neck of a guitar. It's beautiful. Thank you. They, they say it's like having a baby, right? The first one, you know, and the first novel. And then, and, you know, a lot, I read a lot of first novels and they are like a toddler, you know, and clunky steps, but we enjoy them. But here's, here's the first novel that 
the baby comes out talking in full sentences with, uh, with, with a jazzy kind of beatnik groove to them. And so highly two thumbs up on this side and, and go pick it up. And just a delightful book. And, and we can all say, you know, we, we saw you when, you know, in Winnipeg, Canada, of all places. And, uh, you know, good luck to you, my friend. And, and to this is uh, just a marvelous start to what is, I hope, is a wonderful and fulfilling career for you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lyra. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'll now ask you all to just remain in place for one moment. We're going to be moving uh, Nancy to a table just beside our cash desk. Uh, please feel free to join us there. I'll offer a dramatic announcement when all is ready. Uh, at that point, we do have copies of the book that are available for sale at our central cash desk. There are also copies on the table in front of Nancy for Shelby. Uh, the only thing we do ask is that you please do remember to pay for the book at some point before you leave the store, but feel free to get it signed first. He's obsessed with people stealing. <laughs> Every time I come here, I walk out with a bag of books. <laughs> we, took Lara, <laughs> we took Lara off the list for this one evening. Uh, so with that, I'll just ask you to join me in continuing the gratitude for one more moment uh, by acknowledging your, of course, wonderful host for the evening, Lara Ray. <laughs> And of course, Nancy Chislett. Thank you all so very much for coming. Have a wonderful night.